20th chapter of John, Jesus having been crucified, having had the soldiers come unto him and discover that he had died already before they needed to break his legs as with the others, they thrust a spear into his side and out came blood and water. Then his body was taken, laid in a grave. And in John chapter 20, on the first day of the week, the disciples come to the grave and find that he is not there. Mary comes, and Peter, and the disciple that Jesus loved, who we take to be John, came to the grave and found the stone was rolled aside and the Lord was not in the midst. Simon went in, John went in, and then went home. And in verse 11 we read, But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down, and looked into the sepulchre, and see if two angels in white sit in, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. And say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. The angel said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now this lament of Mary's, Mary Magdalene's, when she comes to the sepulchre, is also a lament which is shared by many believers throughout history. Often at times they might cry out, They've taken away my Lord, And I know not where they have laid him. They long for their God. They long for Christ. They long to know him. They long to be with him. But so many places that they go to to seek him, they find to be empty. They go to those places which take the name of Jesus and profess to be churches and congregations which follow him, they go longing to hear his gospel, longing to meet with him, longing to hear his voice, and he's not there. The very places in this world that they should find him or they should think they would find him, they find to be empty. They discover them to be as sepulchres, There's no one there, despite all the form and all the structure, despite all the appearance, despite all the claims and the profession, despite all the scripture that might be quoted, despite the words, despite the activity, they listen for Christ and he's not there. They listen for the gospel and it's not there. And they cry out, they've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. Where is Christ? 
You've got your meetings, you've got your Bible, you've got the words, you can recite the form, you can tell me the facts. But where is Christ? There is a cry from their hearts, which is a real cry. The true believer has life within him, life within her. She knows what it is to be united to Christ. She's heard his voice in the past. She knows what she's listening for. And when she goes to a place where they have all the form and all the profession, but none of the power, none of the spirit, where the true gospel is missing, she knows it's missing. The words won't do, the form won't do, the profession won't do. They've taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. She longs to hear the cry, the voice within. True religion is inward, not outward. The gospel, when we hear it, must be heard inwardly, not just outwardly. We must hear the voice of the Spirit of God. There must be life. And where there isn't life, whatever the appearance, we find the place, we find the people, we find the form, we find the organisation, we find the church to be just a sepulchre. There's no one there. There's no one there. Much of religion today, much of Christendom today, has taken Christ away. They've taken his gospel away. And they've substituted his gospel, they've substituted the grace of the gospel and the righteousness of the gospel with the works and the will of man. They've put law where grace should be. They've put works where faith should be. They put the will of man where the will of God should be. They've taken away the Lord. Or indeed, the Lord has departed from them. For they have not truly the ability to take him away. He's gone, he's not there. Ichabod is above the door. The Lord is not present. He's not in the midst. And the child of God knows it. The child of God goes to their congregation seeking food, seeking meat, seeking bread, and he goes away hungry. He goes looking for the voice of Christ and he goes away, having heard nothing but the words of man. They've taken away the grace of the gospel and put in its place works. They may adorn what they have to make it look beautiful. They may be able to quote the scriptures inside and out. They may have the best form and conduct. They may have the best meetings. They may know the doctrine and be able to quote this and quote that and argue this and argue that. They might adorn themselves wonderfully. They might live in such a noble manner. They've turned from the world and its ways and they live like this and they live like that but it's all in their own strength and it's all of man. We read last week Paul's exhortation in 1 Timothy and Peter's exhortation in 1 Peter 3 regarding the adorning of the woman. And we noted that that exhortation beyond being simply an exhortation to a believing woman, had at its heart an exhortation regarding the woman, the bride of Christ. It's a picture of the bride and the difference between the bride and her adornment and the earthly woman and her adornment. The bride of Christ is not adorned with her own righteousness, her own works. She is adorned in Christ. Christ is within. She is arrayed in righteousness, the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The world and its religion, this other woman, knows 
what the scriptures say. Knows how man should be before God and seeks to adorn itself. It works. It brings forth self-righteous works of righteousness. It dresses itself. It appears wonderful. It broids its hair. It wears gold and pearls and costly array. But it's all outward. Where the bride of Christ, it's all inward. It's all inward in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shamefacedness and sobriety. It's inward. Peter says, There's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. 1 Peter 3, which is in the sight of God of great price. You see, the adorning of the child of God, the adorning of Christ's bride, is not an outward form. It's not her outward works. She's adorned in Christ. And there is a hidden man within her heart. Christ is within And it's his life which is seen without. But where Christ is missing, in the world's religion, in Christendom that professes Christ, in the world's false profession of Christ, where Christ is missing, there is no hidden man of the heart. There is no true life within. So all they can do is adorn themselves with their own works and righteousness. All they can do is put on a show and an appearance, just like the Pharisees who put on a show. They kept the letter of the law outwardly. They looked beautiful when inside they were filthy. But whatever the outward appearance, however it appears before men, in God's eyes, This self-righteous adornment is but filthy rags. It's full of sin, it's full of pride. And there's no life within. There's no life. And the believer who comes in their midst, the woman of whom... Paul speaks in 1 Timothy 2 and Peter in 1 Peter 3. The woman, the bride of Christ, the believer who comes in their midst sees that there's nothing there and cries out, they've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. Mary Magdalene here is one such believer. She's a woman who loved the Lord. She loved him. He was everything to her. Well, he would be. What sort of a woman was Mary Magdalene? She was a filthy sinner. There was no good in her. Like there's no good in you. And there's no good in me. She was a sinner. And she knew she was a sinner. And she knew that any outward adornment she could put on was worthless. Everyone knew she was a sinner. But in Christ, she was perfect. Christ was all to her. And her love for Christ was all within. He was in her heart. She longed to be with him. She longed to hear him. She longed to kneel at his feet and learn of him. Her glory was in Christ alone. She thought nothing of self. There was no outward adornment here. All she wanted was the hidden man of the heart. The hidden man of the heart. The world's religion is all outward. They cover themselves in their own glory, their own works, their own filthy rags of self-righteousness. It's all outward. Mary's religion was all inward. Adorned in Christ. 
Christ within. The world and its religion, however, despises God and despises the work of God. This is why the world in its natural state, this is why women in the world and men in the world despise how God has made them. They despise the natural. They don't see the natural as being beautiful. They've got to dress it up. They've got to add something to it. They've got to improve on how God has made them. And as they do naturally, so they do spiritually. They've got to add. They've got to dress up. They've got to add something of their own. They've got to work. Mary's days of working were long gone. She knew that by her strength, she was heading for hell. She knew that by her deeds, all she'd earned was condemnation. She knew that her works were self-righteous. Her works were filthy. She knew that works could not save her. She knew that her will could not save her. Men speak of having a will, a free will. But what man presented with the gospel has ever truly chosen Christ? He doesn't. His will is free, but it's free to choose sin. It's a fallen will. He's captive to his own nature. He's never sought God. There's none that have sought God. No, not one. There's none that are righteous. No, not one. We've all gone astray. We're dead by nature. We need the gospel, the power of the gospel, the voice of Jesus Christ to make us willing. As David says in Psalm 110, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Oh yes, there's none who believe on Christ who are unwilling. There's none who believe on Christ who do not choose to follow him. They want to, but only because God has changed their will and made them willing. Only because God has brought the dead to life. He's breathed life into their souls and they've risen up with him. And they cry out with life. And they long to be with Christ. And when they go to those sepulchres where they thought they would find him, and they find he is not there, they cry out, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now in Magdalene, this woman knew grace because she knew the Lord. And she longed to be with him. Is he the one you're looking for? This day, is he the one you're looking for? When you come to hear the gospel, when you come to worship, what are you coming for? You coming for some guidance of how to live? You coming for some instruction on how to adorn yourself? Or are you coming, looking for the Lord? Where was she? Where was Mary? The place. Where was she? She was at the sepulchre. She was at the grave where they had laid the dead body of Christ. She was at the grave, the place of death. The place of death. And she was looking for the living in the grave. The other... Gospel writers record these accounts in various manners. In Luke, we read how they came to the grave and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye... The living among the dead. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Why seek ye the living among the dead? But it should be no wonder to us when we go to many of these places 
that take Christ's name but never preach his gospel. But he's not there. Because despite the name, despite the appearance, despite the profession, they are sepulchres, they are graves. They're the place of the dead. And the living isn't amongst the dead. He's not there. In some places he was there once. When his gospel was preached, when his servants were in that building in which they gather, he was there once and he spake. But there came a time when that servant moved on, when that servant died, and when God ceased to speak in that place. Perhaps he was cast out by the people, perhaps the people sought something else. Perhaps when that faithful preacher died, they sought somebody else, more modern, more relevant, more able to get the young people in. Somebody who's moved with the times. And they have someone else come. And despite all the words and all the scripture, God never sent him. God never speaks by him. And Jesus had gone. More relevant. Moving with the times. Well, you can move with the times. But you'd be better moving with Christ. You'd be better going where Christ is. And if in your congregation, which once was faithful to the truth, if you are no longer hearing Christ, you're better to get up and to move and to go and to seek where he is than to remain looking for the living among the dead. Other places have never known him. They've taken his name, they say much about him, they promise life to all around them and all they do is lead people unto death. Christ was never in their midst. We call this apostasy. There are many places taking Jesus' name, taking the scriptures, saying they preach the gospel and they're dead. All they preach is the works and the will of men. All they preach is getting to heaven by your own strength. All they preach is a tower of Babel by which you build and climb up to heaven. And they despise the God of the Scriptures and they despise his Son and they despise his grace and they despise his sovereignty. They want to be the ones to choose, not be the ones in the hands of an angry God who has the power to judge and the power to justify whomsoever he pleases. This world and its religion is apostate. There's a darkness in this world and a darkness which has penetrated its religion. Christ isn't there. He isn't found there. And if the believer goes there, they'll cry out, they've taken away my Lord. When Christ came into this world, came into the darkness, when the light came into the darkness as John's Gospel opens. He came to his own, the Jews. He came to the religion in this world, which could truly testify that God had been in their midst. He didn't come to the false religions of the other nations, he came to the Jews. He came to that people who in one, at one time he had chosen and called out of Egypt. That people under whom he had spoken, that people under whom he had given the law, that people under whom he had given the priesthood, he came unto that people, that people who had the oracles of God, the scriptures, that people who professed to worship him, who professed to serve God, who should have known him and received him at his coming. He came unto them and they received him not. He came unto them and they rejected him. He came unto them and they said he's a troubler in Israel. They came unto them and they took up stones to cast at him, to put him to death. The scribes, the Pharisees, their priests were filled with envy and hatred. Who was this man coming into their world? Who was their man upsetting everything? Who was their man taking the authority away from them? 
They hated him. And in the end they slew him. And they buried him. The Jews did it then. Religion in that day did it then. And the religious do the same today. And you and I have done the same at one point, perhaps, perhaps still. You and I do the same by nature. We don't like this gospel. We don't like this God. We don't like this Saviour by nature. We despise him, we hate him, however religious we may be. We're happy to follow a Jesus of our own making. We're happy to follow a Jesus who follows our will. We're happy to follow a Jesus who receives our works. We want a Jesus who does our bidding because we want to sit upon the throne. Christ is not found in the world's religion. He wasn't found amongst the Jews at the time he came unto them. A few maybe. A few looked for his coming. A few faithful there were who knew the scriptures, who knew Messiah would come and saw him and beheld him and saw his day and rejoiced. But the rest were blinded. And they hated. And they put him to death. Oh, you with your religion. You with your much knowledge of the scriptures. You with your Christian upbringing, perhaps. What do you know of this gospel? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you long to hear his voice? He isn't found in that religion. He isn't found in that religion today. He isn't found in that which is outward either in the world or in its religion. He must be known inwardly. We must see him within. He's the hidden man of the heart. We must hear his voice. He must be real to us. God must speak. And we must hear. As she came to the sepulchre, there were two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. They spake unto her. Two angels, two witnesses, two messengers from God, one at the head and one at the feet. Pointing us to that pathway of their message coming from the head down to the feet, coming down from the head, from heaven above, right down to the members upon the earth. God speaking to man, God mediating. Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. One was at the head where Jesus had lain, one was at the feet where Jesus had lain. They speak of God speaking to his people. They're witnesses. They're preachers. They're messengers. And their message, as recorded in Luke, is that he's not here. He's risen. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And God has sent his messengers, God has sent his preachers into this world and he sends them still and he has them today. And their message in the darkness of this world is that Christ is not in the darkness and he's not in the death and he's not in the grave and he's not in the world's religion. He's risen and you'll know him through the gospel and you'll hear him when he speaks unto you. Don't look for him in the darkness. Don't look for him in the grave. Look for him alive. Look up above. You must hear his voice. 
That's what preachers do. That's why they're here. That's why God sends them. He sends them into the darkness of this world to say that Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has made an end of transgressions. Christ has brought in everlasting salvation. Christ has brought in the righteousness of God for his people. Christ has taken away the judgment. Christ has answered the penalty for all his own. He's died and he's risen again. He's conquered death. He's conquered hell. He's justified his people. He's made an end. He's finished the work. He's accomplished salvation. It's all over. It's finished. There's no more to do. There's no more to add. There's nothing to add to what he's done. There's nothing he demands from you. He's brought it all in by grace freely for sinners such as you. He's done it all. And having done it all, he's risen, he's alive, he's seated on high, he's in glory. And today he's preaching his gospel by his spirit, by his servant to you this day. And we're sent as witnesses to it. Why weepest thou? They've taken him away. Why, Lord, he's in glory. Don't weep. He's conquered. He's brought in a great victory. He's brought in more than you could ever have hoped for or wished for. This is a wonderful day. This first day of the week. This day of the Lord, it's a wonderful day, Mary. They've not taken him away. They never had him. He's in control and he sat down victorious. You need to hear him. You need to find him. She answers, because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And then she turns. When she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. She turned. And there is Jesus. Right there behind her. And he's not dead. He's not lying in the grave. He's not at the mercy of men. He's not at the mercy of men's religion. He's alive. And he's standing and he's victorious. But she didn't know him. Because even though Jesus should stand in front of you. Even though he should stand in front of you this day. Even if the messengers of God so present Christ unto your gaze and so preach him and set him forth in the gospel and he stood there as it were in the words of the gospel right in front of you until God puts faith in your heart and opens your eyes to see him and opens your ears to hear him you still won't see because it's not in your grasp it's not in the intellect you can hear the gospel and ever hear. You can have Christ presented to you and never see. And she turned and saw him standing and knew not that it was Jesus, but he was there. He was there. She turned and saw, but didn't know. She turns from the grave. She turns from death. She turns from the darkness. She turns from the sepulchre. She turns from the world to see. She's turned. Oh, how we need to be turned. How we need repentance. A turning of the mind. A complete change of mind. A complete change of understanding. We need to turn from looking as the world looks. From thinking as the world thinks. From doing as the religious do, we need to be turned by grace to Jesus. She's turned and she sees and she knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. She saw him, and she supposed him to be the gardener. 
the gardener. Well, here she was by a sepulchre, presumably in a garden, presumably where a gardener would tend to the graves or tend to the landscape around. Here's a garden. For it's a garden of death. For in this garden, there's a sepulchre. And she wasn't so mistaken to think him to be the gardener. He may not have been the earthly gardener, but he was the spiritual. In terms of the garden and the gardener, this alludes back to the very beginning. Right back to the Garden of Eden. Right back to Adam. Adam was placed in a garden as a gardener to tend to that garden to name the animals, to look after the garden. There he was, the first man, Adam, a picture of Christ, a picture of the second man, the last Adam, a picture of God's gardener, who has a garden in which he tends, in which he brings forth life, a garden which is his church. Here is the gardener, not just the gardener at that time, in the graveyard, but here's the gardener before her. Adam in the garden found Eden ultimately to be a place of death. In disobedience to the will, to the command of God, in disobedience he followed Eve in eating of the tree, of, in eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in so doing death entered, sin entered, and death by sin And he fell and was cast out and knew the cataclysmic effects of sin, of death and of rebellion against God. He found that garden ultimately to him to be a garden of death, even though in the midst there had been the tree of life of which he never ate. Well, here's Christ, the gardener, the second second man, the last Adam. Who knew what it was as with the first? To experience the fruit, the effects of that tree of which Adam ate in the beginning. That tree brought death to Adam and all his posterity. Christ came for his people and took that death, took that judgment and drank it up. He ate, as it were, that fruit and died as Adam had died. But he took the penalty, the judgment, the wrath of God against the sin that Adam brought in for his people. He took the penalty and took it away. He endured death that he might bring that people to life. He brought them out of a garden of death into a garden of life. He brought them out into another garden, a garden where the tree of life was in their midst and where they would eat of that tree forevermore. And when Mary comes to him, supposing him to be the gardener, he says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And in so asking... He repeats a question he had uttered earlier in another garden. Here he is, this side of his death, risen from the dead. The other side of his death, when the hour of suffering, the hour of judgment approached him, he went with his disciples into another garden, Gethsemane. We read in John 18, Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. Jesus entered a garden over a brook with his disciples. You must come this way, my people, into this garden with me if I'm to bring you into another garden wherein there is life everlasting. And he took his disciples into that garden and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things, 
that should come upon him went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am. And Judas also which betrayed him stood with them. Here he was with his disciples in a garden over the brook Cedron. And his enemies come unto him. And he says unto them, Whom seek ye? And they took him. And they tried him. And they sentenced him to death. And they crucified him. And the people spat upon him. And derided him. And hated him. And nailed him to this cross. And he suffered untold agonies. In the heat of the sun. And the Lord God laid upon him the sin and the sins of his people. And the light of the sun was taken away. And for three hours there was darkness upon the face of the earth. And he endured the judgment of God's wrath for his people's sins. And at the end he cried, it is finished. And he was laid in the grave. And then on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and she found he was not there. And she turned, and she saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. And he said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? The same question. Here you are in a garden. Here is Jesus. Who are you seeking? But here, it's the woman who sought him, his bride, his church, his people, who loved him, who like those others, those chief priests who found him in Gethsemane, who put him to death, they too, by nature, hated him, despised him, and put him to death. But now they are the other side. Now he has taken away their sin. Now he has taken away their rebellion. Now he has taken away their hatred. Now he's taken away the judgment. And he says unto them the other side, having washed them clean, having forgiven them their sins, having taken away the iniquity, having made them to be righteous, he says unto them now, Whom seekest thou? Have you seen this gardener? In this garden... Did he die in your place? Did he die for you? Did he die because you'd eaten of that other tree? Are you seeking him? They'd taken him from that other garden. They'd taken him away to kill him. But now here he is in another garden, appearing to a woman to whom he brings life. He is the tree of life. Oh, the travail he went through in that garden of Gethsemane as his death approached. Oh, the suffering he must endure. Not the suffering, the physical suffering. Not the pain of the nails. Not the physical death. But the judgment of God against sin. And to know his father forsake him in that hour because of what he was made to be what he bore on their behalf because of the judgment which rained down from on heaven oh the shame oh the terrible depths to which he went and the travail he endured in Gethsemane as that hour approached what he endured we will never understand we never comprehend God must reveal it to us we cannot fathom it But oh, what it brought in. Oh, the life which springs forth. Here he is, the other side of death, the firstborn, the first fruits. Here he is. He was sown into the ground as a seed is sown. He died, but now life springs forth. And he comes forth as a tree of life under his people. He is the vine. And we are the branches. He is the tree of life. And we in him are planted as trees of righteousness. 
by the waters, by the brook. Here he is with Mary, the woman, the bride, the church, in his garden. In his garden. For well, the church is his garden. Song of Solomon in chapter 4 alludes to this. The garden, the fruit, the things that are brought forth, his people. There they will find him. Have you found him? Are you in this garden? But she did not know him. Not until he spake. And you will not know him. And I did not know him until he spake. We can read all about him, we can read all the facts, we can have all the scriptures, we can hear a thousand messages preached, but we must hear him speak. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, that is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. And when he uttered her name, she knew it was him. They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Mary, Master. He speaks her name. He knows her. And she knows him. And when she hears his voice, she knows it's him. She'd heard him before. Now she hears him again. This is him. Have you heard his voice? Has he spoken your name? Has he said unto you, Mary? Have you said unto him, Master? This is revelation. You'll only know it when he opens your eyes, opens your ears, speaks your name. Put faith in the heart to look and to behold and to know. Life within is inward. It's inward. But when you hear, there's no need for weeping. The tears are gone. Why weepest thou? He is risen. Whom seekest thou? I am here, Mary. I am here. All is well. The judgment has come, the judgment has gone. Your sins have been blotted out. I have washed them in my own blood. I have paid the price. I have set the captives free. I've set you free, Mary. There's no more trouble, Mary. All will be well, Mary. You're in my garden, Mary. Eat of the tree of life and you shall live forever, Mary. All is well, Mary. Has he called your name? Has he called your name in such a way that he's spoken the gospel? He's spoken it in such power to your heart that he just needs to utter your name and you know all is well. All is forgiven. All that is in front of me is everlasting life and glory. The few years I have to sojourn in this world as I pass through the darkness will be but a moment, but nothing. Those few days, those few years of trial and persecution and sorrow are but nothing because I've seen the Lord. He's risen. He's spoken my name and all is well and one day I will be with him forevermore in his garden by the brook eating of the tree of life. One with the tree of life. There he is. Have you seen him? As he said unto you, Mary, as he said unto him, Master.